which is important in terms of other states. In the Senate, there was a long debate about, and we've had this debate in the past every time we've debated constitutional carry, about the efficacy, if you will, and the safety statistics. It really does need to be noted that New Hampshire is very similar to our neighbor to the West, demographically and in other ways. The state of Vermont has never required a permit to constitutionally carry. The FBI statistics, which are the statistics that should be looked at here, because those are the statistics about violent crime. Not the CDC statistics that you might hear about that include gun-related deaths from suicide, but the violent crime statistics. Vermont is by far and away the safest state in the nation. As I said, demographically similar to New Hampshire. We're very fortunate. We're the fourth safest state in the nation. Maine, which recently adopted this legislation, is the second safest state in the nation. And so it stands to reason that people who have the ability to defend their lives and liberties and their loved ones in those states translated to New Hampshire, we're probably going to become a safer state as a result of this legislation. And isn't that what this is all about? Both the constitutional right and the ability as a state to be as safe as possible. Look at Vermont, look at the main statistics, and please do the right thing as you have in the past on several occasions in this very room and pass Senate Bill 12 as you passed Senate Bill 116 a couple of years ago and a couple of other bills. Mr. Chair, happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for the committee? I might add that we have two hours for this hearing, and the more questions that we have, the longer it's going to take. So I guess there's no questions, Senator. Thank you very much. Dick Hinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, I am Representative Dick Hinch. I represent the town of Merrimack, which is Hillsborough 21, and I have the honor of serving as the House Majority Leader. Mr. Mr. Chairman, it should come as no surprise whatsoever that I'm, I am here in full support unconditionally of this bill. Myself and 95% of House Republicans and a bipartisan majority of the members of this body supported similar legislation in 2015 and 2016, only to have our former governor veto both bills. House and Senate members have been working on this issue for years to achieve this important balance that enhances the rights of law-abiding gun owners, clarifies existing laws to prevent misinterpretation, and preserves public safety. And we are finally in possession of taking the culmination of this work and sending it to a governor who will honor the work of the legislature on this issue on behalf of our many constituents who believe this is a fundamental constitutional right and sign the bill. This bill does not extend rights of those who would be otherwise prohibited by state or federal law from possessing a firearm. Those with criminal intent will continue to obtain, carry, and use firearms in illegal ways, impeding the rights of lawful gun owners based on the action of criminals is frankly unfair. This is not a political bill. This is not a bill that oversteps or overreaches. This is common sense legislation that allows people to protect themselves and their loved ones by exercising their Second Amendment rights under the Constitution. This is reasonable and a long overdue measure 
that will enhance freedom for our responsible firearms community and will be an overall deterrent to crime. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I ask you to recommend this bill ought to pass, and I look forward to joining my fellow House members in passing this legislation in the coming weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and I do have written testimony uh, to pass it. Thank you, uh, Representative Hench. You can pass your testimony to the clerk, I will. and we will call Representative uh, Mike Harrington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I come in support of this bill today and hope it will be passed as it has, as it said, we have a governor that's now going to sign the bill. So I think I'd look at this in a couple of ways. The present law is just plain silly. And as Senator Bradley showed you, I mean, if this is not a cell phone, don't get anyone to get excited. But that is legal to walk down the street. That is not. To me, that's a silly law that says this makes a difference between breaking the law and not breaking the law. If this was a holster and it had a flap on it, and I opened the flap and exposed the weapon, that would be legal. If the flap falls back down, that's illegal. So it's a silly law that sets up silly situations. A few years ago, but I should mention, I have a long time uh, permit, uh, concealed carry permit holder in both uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and I'm also a certified NRA pistol instructor. So I'm familiar with weapons and how to handle them. A situation about a few years ago, before my wife got a carry permit, we were in a parking lot. I was going to win by a newspaper. I, it was the summertime. I just had a t-shirt on. I didn't have any concealed garment. Get out of the truck and I said, oh, guns, see, people you know, makes nerves. A lot of people don't like to see people walk around with a gun. And I can tell you, I walk around with a gun all the time. It's almost always concealed. And I've never had anyone come up to me and go, give me the look like they knew I was carrying it. But I said, well, I'll just leave it in the truck. So I took the holster off and put it down in the seat of the truck. Got out and I said, I just broke the law if I walk in that store because my wife cannot legally be in that truck with a loaded gun, handgun if I'm not there with it. And yet she could stand in the parking lot and hold the gun up for the world to see. And that would be completely legal because she's uh, one of the, like most people in New Hampshire, she's eligible to carry a gun in the open. So I think we're getting rid of what's put some really silly law and silly situations that don't really apply. If you're a criminal and you're going to go in and rob a store, you're not going to be deterred by the fact, oh, I can't carry a gun concealed because I'm willing to kill somebody. So I don't think there's any relationship to that. And the last thing I want to mention is the suitable person standard. As with most, and people will speak on this more after me, but most gun control laws that were passed in the United States were passed, one of the main reasons for passing them was to prevent minorities from obtaining guns. And you know, this was passed a long time ago in New Hampshire, and I'm sure a suitable person back then was a white Anglo-Saxon male Protestant. And if you weren't, eh, you probably weren't quite so suitable. And that's the same thing that was done in other states to prevent uh, uh, African Americans from getting guns. So the suitable person is something that is so arbitrary. I mean, if we're going to allow the police chief to decide that that's a suitable person to have the gun, do we do the same for driver's license? Well, I see Fred, he buys an awful lot of beer, and I saw him at the state liquor store. It's only a matter of time before he's going to drive drunk. Let's take his driver's license away right now, because he's not a suitable person. So that type of arbitrary law should, no, has no place in New Hampshire or the United States. And I strongly urge you to vote in favor of this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other <coughs> sponsors of Senate Bill 12 present in the room? And what we're going to do at this point in time, we're going to go to the people. <clears throat> Those reps who have uh, signed up, you're going to have to wait because this is uh, going to hear from the uh, folks who are going to benefit from the passage, or not passage, of this bill. With that, we call Susan Olson. Training, education, 
and safety organization dedicated to empowering the women of the state of New Hampshire. I appear before you today for the third time in support of the language in Senate Bill 12. The plain language of this bill, which has been made plain three different times, restores the rights of people, restores rights that were summarily dismissed approximately a hundred years ago from all law-abiding law New Hampshire citizens by a legislature determined to punish people, to punish people who did not look like them, who did not sound like them, or who did not work like them. This simple bill ends once and for all the ethnic and racial discrimination that disarmed nearly 20% of New Hampshire's population in 1923. That 20% was a little more than 91,000 people at the time. And if we were to take that to today's uh, population of New Hampshire, that 20% would be about the same as the city of Manchester. I want you to think about that. So that 20% was disarmed by the legislature, but it left 80%, the remaining 80%, still being required to ask permission of local law enforcement to exercise rights that they'd had on January the 9th. Imagine if your parents, my parents, I'm older than a lot of you guys, your grandparents or your great-grandparents waking up on the 9th of January enjoying the same rights as their neighbors enjoying the same rights as the people they worked with at the Aniskeg Mills, only to have a legislature decide that we don't like you. You're unruly. You've disrupted the city of Manchester. You've made demands on people. And for that reason, we're frightened of you. And because we're frightened of you, we're going to disarm you. That's what happened in 1923, House Bill 26 did just that. That is a shameful mark on this state. Today, you're going to hear from people who say, well, this is, this is public safety. Um, local law enforcement are the only people who can decide whether or not they can see in your eyes or gaze into your heart and determine whether or not you're a suitable person, whether they're not frightened of you or whether you have the right that maybe their neighbor doesn't to exercise those rights. We think that's wrong. Mr. Harrington was exactly right. Not only is this a silly law, it's a shameful law. Today, for the third time, I stand in this chamber. Actually, it's not quite two years ago today, I think. February something that we first talked about this language in this house. I'm gonna ask you today to vote in support of Senate Bill 12, to remove the ability of someone to judge you based on your DNA, the number of your chromosomes, the origin of your last name, and to restore to 100% of the law-abiding citizens of New Hampshire the right to exercise their natural born rights of self-defense. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, I believe Many of you received a background paper from us, so I'm not submitting testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair calls. Kimberly Moore. First time I ever testified in front of the legislature was in this room for this same bill. Because this same legislation we're talking about today is the same legislation. Oh, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> I think that happened last time too. 
Uh, this is the same legislation that's already been passed by both the Senate and the House two times, exact same language. And we found out a lot of things during this process. The New Hampshire Department of Safety actually admitted some New Hampshire citizens are abused by government employees because of this exact law. The same way people were abused back in the 1920s, they're still being abused today. So I ask you, what amount of abuse is okay? Is a little bit of child abuse okay? Domestic abuse, sexual abuse, animal abuse? I'm pretty sure all of us here today would agree that no form of abuse of any kind is ever okay. We've had women testify, and they have testified in this same room that they were denied to be their right to carry concealed how they saw fit because their police chief thought they didn't need to because they were a woman. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, that's absolutely abhorrent. People had to get us, women had to get a senator involved so she could practice her right because her police chief denied her because she was a woman. I gotta tell you right now, women are the people who need to protect ourselves the most, and we're damn good shots. We're not gonna put up with this kind of abuse from people in our own state. And the thing is, what about the women who didn't have a voice for them, didn't have a senator to go to, the single mom who wanted to protect herself but couldn't afford to take time from, off from work, couldn't afford thousands of, uh, thousands of dollars of attorney fees, or was afraid. Because not everyone and not every woman has a big mouth like me and will stand up to people who are doing something wrong. Hey, I can say it, I admit it. Y'all know it's true. <laughs> and, and the thing about this, this bill is, it only affects law-abiding citizens. This law doesn't do anything to stop criminals. It literally only affects all of us in this room who are law-abiding citizens. You'll hear hysterics from hoplophobes who will say that, oh my God, illegal aliens and everyone, all these bad people are gonna get, be able to conceal carry. No, they're not. Because those people can't even legally purchase and possess firearms today. This only affects law-abiding citizens. The only people in this state who are being abused by this law are law-abiding citizens. That's why it's time to end the abuse. You know, it's, it's interesting, I said, you know, I've been here a few go-rounds, and it passed both times, but what's the difference today? The difference today is that on November 8th, voters had a choice to make. They could vote for a governor who was for gun control and against this bill, or they could vote for a governor who said he would sign this bill if it came across his desk because all of you passed it and then the House passed it and the Senate. The voters made a choice on November 8th. All of you here are supposed to be re representing your voters and your constituents. They want to end the abuse. They're sick of coming back here every, every few months to have to stand up for their rights and end the abuse and having it just be vetoed. So they decided to change that. And that's what we're all counting on, all of you here today, to do exactly what the voters elected you to do and elected Governor Sununu to do. It's time to end the abuse. Please vote ought to pass on SB 12. Thank you. Uh, Chair Collins, Alan Rice. Chairman, members of the committee, good morning. For the record, my name is Alan Rice. I am the Vice President and Training Director of the New Hampshire Firearms Coalition, an organization representing thousands of law-abiding firearms owners, dealers, and manufacturers. I'm also here on behalf of our partners and gun owners of America, a national organization which represents hundreds of thousands of law-abiding firearms owners. We strongly support Senate Bill 12, and we urge you to promptly vote this bill ought to pass 
without any amendments or changes. As you probably know and you've heard, our neighbor to the west, Vermont, has never required a license or permission from bureaucrats to carry a concealed firearm. In 2015, Maine passed a constitutional carry law to do away with that state's permit requirement. None of the three northern New England states has required a license to carry a firearm openly or unconcealed. Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are consistently ranked as three of the safest states in America. Three of the safest states. Criminals prefer unarmed victims. Concealed carry works because the gun is concealed and a criminal does not know if his potential victim is able to fight back. The right to own, carry, and use firearms for self-defense is a constitutionally protected civil right and should not end when a person puts on a coat. The founders did not contemplate citizens groveling to public officials to exercise that right. That is a 20th century creation. The police have no duty to protect average citizens, and according to the U.S. Supreme Court, the police cannot be held responsible for failure to prevent a crime. Armed self-defense by law-abiding people has been proven to work. In the summer of 2014, a doctor prevented a mass shooting at a hospital in Pennsylvania when he used his concealed firearm to stop a gunman. The doctor wisely ignored the hospital's gun-free zone policy. Police said had it not been for the armed doctor, the criminal would have gone out in the hallway and walked down through the offices until he ran out of ammunition. On New Year's Eve 2014-2015 in Osceola County, Florida, a pastor prevented a possible mass shooting in his church, saved the lives of several men, women, and children when he used his firearm to stop a shooter. We at the New Hampshire Firearms Coalition and Gun Owners of America trust our, our, our fellow citizens to follow the law and behave responsibly. If someone does commit a crime while carrying a concealed firearm, there are many statutes which provide for prosecution and, if convicted, incarceration. We don't object to the arrest and prosecution of real criminals. The mere act of carrying a firearm, concealed or otherwise, should not be a crime. What we strongly object to is the practice of making otherwise law-abiding people ask permission to carry a concealed self-defense firearm. We have seen far too many cases of these issuing authorities, bureaucrats, abusing their authority and denying licenses to people who are legally allowed to own and use firearms. People who do not have a felony conviction on their record have been denied. When this happens, that person must appeal the denial in a court of law. The process is costly and expensive and slow. That's not the way things ought to be. The law abiding should not be treated as presumptive criminals. SB 12 will put a stop to these abuses. Three years ago, the Department of Safety quietly changed the application for a pistol revolver license without any public notice, hearing, or attention. They slipped the changes in quietly, and when caught, claimed it was in response to a court case. Who was in charge of the Department of Safety? Who was watching the department? If SB 12 becomes law, the application form becomes irrelevant. Currently, the New Hampshire pistol revolver license is recognized by 27 other states under reciprocity provisions of those states' laws. The sponsors of Senate Bill 12 have wisely left the licensing provisions in place. However, since other provisions of law are being repealed, the license becomes optional. It remains in place for the sole purpose of reciprocal carry in other states. For the reasons stated, New Hampshire Firearms Coalition and Gun Owners of America urge this committee to vote Senate Bill 12 ought to pass without any amendments or changes. I thank you for your time, your consideration, and most of all, your public service. I would like to hand in a stack of petitions. Now, <coughs> residents of the state urging passage of this bill. I'd like to give this to the committee. It's a pretty good sized stack. I can get you more if you need it. I'll just do it over here. <coughs> Questions may have. I see no questions. Thank you very much for your time.
testimony. Thank you. Chair Falls, uh, Earl Cole. Saying good morning to everyone who took the time to come up here and testify for or against this bill. <clears throat> I am here in armed support of this bill <clears throat> because there's another form of discrimination that people haven't made reference to yet, and that's, and that's discrimination against people <clears throat> with disabilities. Each and every time <clears throat> I've applied for a permit, in the back of my mind, I've wondered <clears throat> whether the issuing authority may see my chair and may wonder if I'm bright enough to be able to handle a gun and own a gun responsibly. <clears throat> well, let me tell you a little bit about me first. I have been active in state and local politics for at least 10 years. I'm a member of the State Republican Committee, and I am also the owner of three pets. Additionally, I've worked with the likes of Kelly Ayotte, I'm in talks with Annie Custer, and I've been in talks with Jim Sheen in the past about passing reasonable and responsible, or, uh, about passing, uh, quite, fran quite frankly, what amounts to be revolutionary pet reform. So, <clears throat> without sounding <clears throat> well, without sounding too full of myself, or perhaps, or, or, or without sounding pompous, I consider myself to be a bright and articulate man. And for those of you who may look at me and just see my chair, well, <clears throat> may I respectfully say to you that if that's all you see, then you don't see me. Do not deny me the right to carry to, to, to right to carry. Do not deny me the right to the right to carry concealed because of my disability. I am at a disadvantage. The right to and so the right to carry concealed is a moral imperative. If I were to open carry, that would that would in fact that would that would in fact put me in a position of great peril. Because somebody could simply see the gun and pick it off of my hip. So, as I said, passage of this bill is a moral imperative. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. The chair will call Amy Lott. Sandy Hook, 
they've absorbed some of the terror of that day. Thanks to gun violence, trauma and loss are now threads woven into their identities. This is true for my son in particular, who was five in 2012, old enough to know what was happening. He turns off the radio in the car now because he doesn't want to hear any bad news going on around the world. He hates conflict and often expects the worst. I think he sees more bad guys than he used to. Two Aprils ago, he ran in a local kids' race, and as we were driving home, he confessed to me that he had been kind of worried that there was going to be a bomb at the finish line. Last summer, around the campfire at night, he told me that he'd been thinking about death and had three questions. Does it hurt? Is it dark? And will there be stars? Now, I know that a concealed carry permit would not have stopped the massacre at Sandy Hook, but permits for concealed carry offer some measure of protection against gun violence. Some people will argue that carrying concealed weapons can prevent violence and help people protect themselves. This is a myth perpetuated by the NRA. It is far more likely that guns will be used to harm people than to stop a crime. Please don't laugh. That's rude. I live in the North Country. I'm not anti-gun. I'm pro-common sense. And requiring people to apply for a concealed carry permit is common sense. What is the harm in doing so? If you have nothing to hide, then why not take that extra step? Your minor inconvenience can mean peace of mind for myself and for my son Wyatt and many other residents of our state. Please oppose Senate, Senate Bill 12. Please help the many people like me and my children who look at the world and see more bad guys than we used to feel safe in public places. Thank you. Thank you, testimony. Again, members of the committee, if you wish to ask any questions, please just raise your hand. Chair will call Ralph Tomiko. testimony today that uh, blood's going to run in the streets, uh, that there's going to be an increase in carrying of firearms, and I doubt very much uh, that this is true. When you're a felon, you very well know what your limitations are. They tell you at your sentencing, they tell you at your parole hearings, and no uncertain terms of firearms involved in your life uh, for a good period of time after you're a felon. To assume that the passage of this law is going to be an opening of the floodgate uh, for felons to all of a sudden feel or think that they can carry guns is foolhardy. So I implore this uh, committee uh, to please pass this. Um, 
It's a worthwhile bill, long time in coming. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Questions of the committee? Okay, I remind those who are testifying too that we try not to be repetitive. We do go quite a bit, not that anyone's being repetitive, but just remind you if it's being said that uh, try to keep it to a few minutes. Chair, Chair will call Claire Summer.
such a hardship to have people have licenses. I'm asking you to stand on the side of common sense and public safety. I'm also here at the request of one other New Hampshire gun violence survivor who lost his daughter and was shot himself. He could not be here today because he's working. I ask you to listen to your constituents, to listen to the police association charged with maintaining public safety, and to listen to those of us who truly understand the risk of a gun in the wrong hands. You have the power to prevent another 13-year-old girl from feeling the pain that I once felt and I still feel today. Please vote no on Senate Bill 12, which will make New Hampshire residents, including women and children, less safe. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. The chair will call Penny Dean. Hi, my name is Penny Dean and I'm an attorney. For those who don't know me, I'm licensed in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts and I'm admitted to the federal courts in all those states, the DC Circuit, the United States Supreme Court, and courts of appeals, and I practice in those courts. And I'm really a pragmatic person, and I come to you asking you to pass the bill, or I'm sorry, pass this, but to amend, to add three little words, New Hampshire or federal. <coughs> and those three little words should be put in line, or in paragraph three, Line five, before by statute. And here's the reason. Unfortunately, in this state, our judges are appointed. They're accountable to no one as a practical matter. When they twist and distort the law that you've passed, you can't unelect them. They're there for life. And what we've had happen over the years is the courts have not been as protective as our firearm rights as the general court has been. This general court has been very responsive to gun owners. Repeatedly, we've come before you and said, look, you passed this law, and I've had representatives who passed the law say, what's unclear about these words? They're clear as crap. And I'd say, well, not to this particular judge, they're not, here's what they wrote. And they'll look at the opinion and say, how does this comport with the plain meaning of the statute? But the bottom line is that we have to be real about what we deal with. And this bill, which is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing that's gonna help a lot of good people and allow a lot of good people to be safe and exercise their rights. Without that fix, without those three words being added, here's what I see a court doing. I see a court saying, look, the legislature, because they take your words literally when they want to, not when you want them to, but when they want to, is presumed to mean what it says and say what it means. And when a legislature passes a bill, Oops, and I'm talking about this bill here. <clears throat> and the First Amendment puts, unless the applicant is prohibited by New Hampshire or federal statute from possessing a firearm, they say that's very clear to us. But then the legislature in this same bill comes down and says, by statute, from possessing a firearm in the state of New Hampshire. So by statute is not modified by New Hampshire. Federal statute means any statute in the country. It means a statute in Georgia that maybe has nothing to do with what we consider safe firearms ownership. It has to do with any statute anywhere that would prohibit someone from possessing firearms, even if there wasn't a priori in federal law. Now let me tell you what I've been asked over the years. Is sometimes people say, well, give us examples of this. And my answer is the same way that I would give my clients. And sometimes you have to rely on my education, training, and experience to make reasonable predictions of to how certain courts will handle things. If you want me to give you concrete examples, you're talking sometimes 10, 20, 30 hours of research. So I say to my client, if you want to pay me for that research, I'll come back with tons of examples. Or you can do what you did when you come to me, which is rely on me to say, look, I've been here before. I think this is how it's going to go down. And the reason I say this, one example is the RSA 
159 6E, which was passed by this general court years ago in response to the fact that some district court judges were known to be non-firearm friendly. And so we had a bill put in that said they have an option, licensees, to go to the superior court, which gave people another option for fairness. And what the Supreme Court has done over the years in New Hampshire is narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and twisted that statute so in my mind it is unrecognizable. They had taken cases, for example, my cases that came from the Superior Court repeatedly. I've never been to a district court with licensing cases in my entire career. <clears throat> Not only did they accept them, they decided them. And then came time when a particular entity objected to me going to the Superior Court. And they said, well, she can't come to the Superior Court. Jurisdiction is only in the district courts. And the Supreme Court said, oh yeah, that's right. You shouldn't be getting to go to the Superior Court. And I said, well, gee, how come you decided all my other cases that came from the Superior Court? Because the first issue before a court is, do you have jurisdiction? Before you can even hear a case, you gotta have jurisdiction. And the Supreme Court said, oh, well, they might have been in error. And so the bottom line here is that people need to be able to protect themselves and not everybody has the money to hire a lawyer. Not everybody can go to court. And quite frankly, not everybody can wait to exercise their rights. And the bottom line is that people need this. Um, I can tell you what's happening in the case of mine today, right now. And my client fortunately has given me permission to discuss it with this committee. His name's Dave Bouchon and he lives in Nashua. Nashua, in my mind, has a pattern and practice of demanding essentially photographs. Years ago, we had chiefs of police in this state demanding fingerprints and photographs before they would issue a license. And they would very coyly say, well, the law doesn't say I can't. And so those of us in the firearms community came before the general court and said, look, chiefs of police are demanding fingerprints and photographs. And out of that passed RSA 15096 Roman II, which is no fingerprints or photographs will be required. Well, I give the chiefs an A for ingenuity because they said, okay, we can't take photographs anymore, but we demand your driver's license. And that all has a color photograph on, so we copy it or scan it on our high-speed scanner. We now still have a photograph. And what they do is they find endless ways to get a law around the law, endless ways. And the sad thing is they don't just pick on the minorities, the disenfranchised. Sometimes they pick on regular people. I almost had to sue the city of Concord over my license. And I can tell you that I've never been arrested or charged with anything in my life. But the bottom line is some of the chiefs and some of the licensing entities do this because they can. And really, the thing that you have to ask yourself is, are, is this gonna make a difference to any type of crime rate? Law-abiding citizens are still gonna obey the law, and criminals are not gonna be concerned if there's one more violation of law that they're making here. So I respectfully ask you to pass this with my three words added, and I think it would make a difference. And here's what I always say. People say, well, wait, let's pass it, and a few years down the road, if there's a problem, come back, we'll amend it. What about the people you heard in the interim? Does anybody ever think about those people? And I do, because not everybody can afford a lawyer, and not everybody, even that can afford a lawyer, wants the publicity that comes along with a lawsuit against the town. And so I'm happy to answer your practical questions if you have any, but I respectfully say this is really, <coughs> excuse me, really, really necessary. And I think the bottom line is that there are people like me who still will always have a license. And so the form, I think, is still relevant, the form that the state police prepare. Because in order for to have limited reciprocity, you're still gonna need a license. So I think there's still gonna be a whole pile of people getting licenses still. But what this is going to do is allow those who to $10, there was a time in my life $10 was a lot of money to me. It certainly isn't today, but there was a time that $10 made the difference to groceries or no groceries. And we still have a lot of people like that in this state. And do they deserve to protect themselves? You know, that $10 that people pay for a license does make a difference to some. And I respectfully ask you to consider those that can't afford to take a day off work and come here and speak to you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Of course, the committee. The chair will call Tony Lucas. Hello, I'm Tony Lucas. I live 
live in uh, Hudson. I'm a uh, firearms instructor and I train people to be firearms instructors. And over the years I've had a number of women who've come to me for training because they had an immediate threat. Um, they may have gotten a restraining order, but they understand that those things don't enforce themselves and you know, the police just don't have the manpower to protect everybody 24-7. And uh, you know, they've been, sometimes it's been a very emotional experience for them. They hadn't considered getting a firearm before, but in that situation they chose to and I've been able to provide them training. And you know, someone in that position should not have to wait to be able to have a firearm to carry. And they shouldn't be at risk of uh, you know, some arbitrary decision that they're not a suitable person. Um, and in general, providing public officials with uh, you know, uh, discretion on who can exercise a constitutional right is a bad idea. It's wrong and inevitably it will lead to some abuses. And often it's the people who are you know, least able to defend themselves and um, you know, get their rights back who are most likely to be abused. Um, the other thing is people talked about the difference, you know, it's legal to carry openly, you need the permit to carry concealed or carry in your motor vehicle. In general, I recommend that people carry concealed because as the, uh, the previous speaker of the wheelchair said, there is a risk if somebody sees the firearm um, especially if they're bigger or stronger than you or there's more than one of them, they might take that opportunity to take it away from you. Or if it's, if it's concealed, it's not a risk and it'll stay concealed unless you need it. So in general, it's safer. And I'd uh, you know, rather not put something else in the way of people carrying concealed rather than carrying openly. Uh, thank you. Mr. Uh, Lakers, you indicated on here that you opposed the bill. No, I support the bill. If I can check I the code. I thought you did. Uh, yeah, yeah. No change. You've seen me before. If I did that, that was an error. Chief Brent Hot Hotnum. And it'll be followed by Harrison Debris. We're going to do this to speed it up a little bit. So the Harrison debris can be next in line right after the chief. May proceed. Good morning, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association. Uh, and I would like to say that the New Hampshire uh, Chiefs oppose the bill as written. We don't necessarily oppose the idea of carrying a concealed weapon un unlicensed or having a required permit. But we do, uh, we do oppose this as written. Um, I've handed in uh, uh, written testimony for the committee to review. I don't want to take up too much time. I know we have a lot of speakers. Uh, primarily, our concern is around paragraph three, the, the use of the word firearm, as opposed to pistol or revolver, which is used throughout the remainder of the statute. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison Debris. He was never even charged with a crime. He was denied because of this. 
Where's the due process? Uh, a former colleague of mine in uh, Tuftonboro was denied because of a 20-year-old misdemeanor marijuana possession conviction. Should that really limit someone's ability to defend themselves when they've had no further interaction with the law? Um, all of these people can still possess and openly carry a firearm in New Hampshire. A local patrolman I know from Nottingham summed it up perfectly. In New Hampshire, you always assume everyone is armed. So the argument that you won't know that people with guns have guns if they don't require a license is invalid at best. And even myself have had problems. I renewed my license last year. The Dover police chief refused to sign my license. Instead, he had a sergeant sign it. Um, he even violated the law by taking longer than 14 days to issue it. The reason, supposedly, was because my references did not respond. They're not required by law to respond. And there's no even requirement in law that the references even have to be listed on the uh, form. This is all very arbitrary. So this is why I ask you to vote yay on SB 12. Thank you. And I have written testimony to submit. Thank you for your testimony. Deborah Howard. And you'll be followed by Andrew Gregor. Thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Deborah Howard. I'm a mom of two and a volunteer with the New Hampshire chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. We are a grassroots movement of American mothers, fathers, and others fighting for public safety measures that respect the Second Amendment while protecting Americans from gun violence. Moms Demand Action is part of Every Town for Gun Safety, the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country with more than three and a half million members. The most the important question here is, will this bill make New Hampshire safer? And the answer to that question is no. Concealed carry without a permit will not reduce crime. Civilians carrying guns rarely thwart shooters, and they may impede and endanger responding law enforcement. Therefore, this law will do nothing to make our state safer. In fact, it will make New Hampshire less safe by allowing dangerous people to legally carry concealed, loaded guns in public with no criminal record check and no oversight by lo local law enforcement. <coughs> Requiring a permit to carry a concealed firearm has worked well in New Hampshire for 90 years. The permit is quick and easy to obtain and does not place an unreasonable burden on law-abiding citizens. There are some people who are inconvenienced by having to go to the police station once every four years and pay a small fee. And there are fewer unfairly denied a permit. These cases and the inconvenience are outweighed by the need for public safety. Law enforcement are being killed and injured on duty at alarming rates in the US and in New Hampshire. We say that blue lives matter, but we are proposing to take away one of the tools that law enforcement use to protect themselves and the public. New Hampshire is currently one of 31 states that give law enforcement the authority to deny a permit to people who, if they carry concealed guns, would pose a threat to public safety. Law enforcement officers often have relevant knowledge of people seeking a permit, such as prior incidents of domestic abuse, mental illness, or other violent behavior. In each of the last two years, the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police has spoken out against similar bills. We should support law enforcement by giving them the tools they need to help keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. People have stated that having civilians with guns makes it harder for them to do their job, uh, sorry, police. Police have stated that having civilians with guns makes it harder for them to do their job. How are they to know who was one of the shooters and who was a good guy with a gun when they arrive at a chaotic scene? At the incident at the State Empire State Building a few years ago, even police with comprehensive ongoing training accidentally shot nine innocent bystanders in the chaos of a stressful active shooter event. Proponents of this bill argue that more people in public carrying concealed guns will make us safer. The facts say otherwise. While the gun lobby claims that armed citizens avert crimes, research by the Department of Justice showed that people rarely use guns to defend themselves in this way. Stanford University researchers have found that so-called right to carry laws are associated with higher rates of aggravated assault, rape, robbery, and murder. According to CDC data from 2014, Vermont, which has no requirement for concealed carry permit, had a death by gun rate of 10.3 10 per, 10 per 100,000 compared to 8.7 in New Hampshire. Massachusetts, which has stricter laws around concealed carry, had a death by gun rate of only 3.2 per 100,000. 
We are all fallible human beings who get angry, drink too much, careless, or are under stress. Everyone having a gun at their side at all times carries the risk of escalating the outcomes of disputes or these negative emotional states. These stresses and states are a routine part of life, whereas most of us will never be caught in an active shooter situation. The risks of more guns in public far outweighs the few times that people may potentially defend themselves. After the state of Missouri repealed permit requirements for purchasing handguns in 2008, their homicide rate rose 18%, while the national rate fell by 11%, according to John Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research. Without training, and none is required in New Hampshire, armed civilians cannot effectively engage shooters. In New Hampshire, there is no training on made, making critical shoot or don't shoot decisions. Joseph Vince, a leading national expert, recommends training that involves real life scenarios, shooting in stressful situations, and firing range practice. If concealed, carries do, if concealed carry holders do not have this training, and they are not required to in New Hampshire, then they will not be making the public more safe by carrying a concealed gun. Also, there is no public demand for the current law to be changed. In a study by Survey USA in April of 2015, 73% of New Hampshire voters support keeping the current concealed carry permit system in place. In addition, 71% of gun owners and 74% of concealed carry permit holders themselves support the current system. The Second Amendment to the Constitution gives people the right to bear arms. As Supreme Court Justice Scalia stated in the Heller decision, that right is not unlimited. He wrote, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. He also stated that the court even recognizes a long-standing judicial precedent to consider prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons. As the Supreme Court has stated, it is possible to balance the right of individuals with the safety of communities. I am asking you to search your conscience do you believe that taking away one of the tools law enforcement in New Hampshire has to ensure public safety is for the good of the people? Is the inconvenience of the few worth putting the larger community at risk? And what, are the pe right, what about the right of the people to live their lives free from the threat of gun violence? Why should we dismantle the current system that has worked well for 90 years? I urge you to vote SB 12 inexpedient to legislate. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for your testimony. The chair calls Andrew Rigor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for your time today. My name is Andrew Gregoire, and I reside in Manchester's Ward 5. I'm a proud member of the Democratic Party, and I'm here to speak in support of SB 12. As a progressive, I always fight to defend the rights of women, minorities, members of the LGBTQ plus community, and other marginalized groups. I believe these classes are the very people most negatively affected by our current concealed carry law. When police chiefs, or even town selectmen, have the power to determine who is suitable to carry a firearm in New Hampshire, minority groups are the first to be negatively impacted. In fact, it's these types of laws that have historically been crafted for the sole purpose of disempowering marginalized groups. In 1923, the New Hampshire General Court added the suitable person language to our laws in RSA 159.6. According to the House Journal, the new law was passed to, quote, control the possession, sale, and use of pistols or revolvers, and required that, quote, no person shall sell, deliver, or otherwise transfer a pistol or revolver to a person who is an unnaturalized foreign-born citizen, or foreign-born person. In order to understand the weight of those terms, you must realize that in 1923, the process of naturalization was still largely governed by the Federal Naturalization Act of 1790, which limited naturalization to immigrants who were, quote, free white persons of good character. New Hampshire's 1923 law was written with the full intent of denying any non-white person the, the right to possess a firearm. There is no denying that, given the setting and cultural tendencies of the time, 
This law was simply a xenophobic and racist effort to prevent certain people from acquiring and carrying firearms. I am glad that New Hampshire now ranks among the least racist states in the country, but we need our laws to reflect our evolved sentiments. Unfortunately, given recent political changes at the national level, that very same xenophobic discrimination has reared its ugly head, even today in 2017. With hate crimes against minorities reaching the highest point in my lifetime, fueled by a firestorm of executive orders signed by Mr. Trump, the minority situation has never been more dire. We must act now to restore equality here in New Hampshire and allow our most vulnerable citizens to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves and their families pursuant to Article 2A of the New Hampshire Constitution. Still, xenophobia is not our only problem here in New Hampshire. Blatant sexism and gender discrimination are also playing a part. We saw this in Hampton in recent years when a young woman was denied a permit and pressured into providing a photocopy of her driver's license and vehicle registration. These are not requirements under our concealed carry law, and it should be noted that her husband was not asked to satisfy these same requirements. We saw gender discrimination in Wyndham as well, when a mother was denied a permit because her listed character references did not reply in time. Another request that is not required by law. These are just two cases that I know of personally, and I'm certain there are many others. It seems the patriarchy is alive and well in many towns indeed. Discrimination of any type runs afoul of Article 2A of the New Hampshire Constitution, and I urge all members of this body to vote ought to pass on Senate Bill 12 without amendment. We can and we must undo more than a lifetime of racist law and restore the rights of women and minorities here in New Hampshire without delay. I am so relieved <clears throat> that this law will take effect immediately upon its passage. This means that even as the ink is drying in the governor's signature, we will be rolling back a century of racist, sexist, and xenophobic discrimination in New Hampshire. This is clearly the will of the people of this state, and this must be done. The time is now to stand on the side of equality. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. John Hornwater. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, I'm John Hollenwater, uh, here today on uh, behalf of the National Rifle Association and all its members here in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, as you know, this is not a new issue, um, and it's been around three times, and we're hoping that the third time is a charm, and I'm looking at some of the paintings back there, and I know George Washington is probably thinking the same thing, along with some of his friends. But I want to thank uh, Senator Bradley, again, for uh, introducing this bill. I want to thank you with your diligence to, to do this three times and uh, having this hearing today. I want to thank everybody uh, showing up here today for this hearing. Um, again, this is a, a, not a novel idea, not only for New Hampshire, but across the country. I don't know if it's been mentioned yet today, but there's 11 other states that have similar legislation. And there's going to be uh, a number more uh, having it. Uh, this legislative cycle is New Hampshire has been kind of put in a stalled out position. More and more states have been passing uh, this legislation. Now, I, I have an opportunity to travel to a lot of states uh, where I hear a lot of testimony on a lot of different bills, and I've heard it on uh, bills that actually created uh, the system of where we are with the license and permitting system. And I can tell you that. In the course of these debates, we heard the same opposition that we're hearing here today, that it's going to increase individuals carrying guns, it's going to increase felons carrying guns, uh, crime rates are going to be soaring. Uh, bottom line, none of those things happen. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, despite what you've heard here today, statistics show that states that not only eliminate victim zones, but have liberal laws dealing with these licensing systems that we do have in some of the states show lower crime rates. 
And one only has to take a look to your neighboring state of Maine, and Maine, I believe, still has more guns per capita in their population than any other state, but they have one of the lowest crime rates, which, very good evidence that it's not about the guns that are out there, it's about the people behind the guns. I'm going to avoid a long speech. I did submit some written testimony, but I do want to, uh, I do want to point out one thing, because it had been mentioned today that this does keep the, the, the current system for individuals to take advantage of reciprocity. Uh, Maine's legislation did the same thing. In fact, the last uh, quarter where they were taking a look at uh, permits being issued, Maine was right where it was before they passed the law. So I think you're going to see similar results here in the state of New Hampshire where people are still going to get permits to be able to take care of those, uh, you know, for those who, who wish to travel. But the good news is for those individuals who may unknowingly get into someone's car, like let's say your wife jumps into your car, your firearm's in the car under the seat, that individual, law-abiding citizen, doesn't have to worry about, uh, about being arrested. So it, it's going to be correcting a host of transport issues and, and, and issues with individuals who should have permits but have not been issued permits. So with that, um, uh, instead of cutting me off, I'm going to cut myself off. I thank you again for, uh, for taking another look at this bill and look forward to uh, this bill making it to the governor's desk. Thank you for your testimony. Chair calls Mike Farron. It'll be followed by Xandra Rice Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson and Representatives. I'm Mark Farron from Keene. I come here today as a follower of uh, Jesus, hopefully common sense, and evidently a uh, part-time microphone operator. I come, I think, in opposition of SB 12, although I appreciate Andrew's testimony. I'm not for discrimination, certainly at all. But let me say I'm not for taking away guns, but there are some son of a guns, and I believe we should make it tougher for them to obtain firearms and make it safer and some set of uh, daughters as well, I think. However, I admit I'm a peace person, not P-I-E-C-E. -E. We have enough people seeking the peace that I believe causes more violence, more death, and more ill-tempered machismo. The peace that Jesus and Gandhi and Dr. King and Mother Teresa spoke about is the peace I see and aim a little earlier. The peace that John Lewis continues to speak about and almost get killed over is the peace I seek and I hope that citizens of New Hampshire do as well. Wayne Perrier has stated, the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun, we all know, who's a good guy with a gun. Problem for me is that we're not all good people. We're bad sometimes. We are not always law-abiding citizens. Anybody here good all the time? This guy is good. You, you along with President Trump, I guess, who said that. I think my parking meter is expired, so I'm not law abiding at this time. Potentially, and even instantaneously, we all could become bad folks. We see it all the time. All I'm saying is that I believe we need to have safer gun regulations, not less, especially with people who are challenged. And I'm not talking about Earl, who was up here earlier, although he was an open Raiders fan. Like people, for instance, who would buy t-shirts that say this. Tell me if these are true. This product contains lead, a chemical known to cause sudden injury and death to those who oppose freedom and the Second Amendment. Diversity. I don't discriminate. I shoot everything. Gun control is as foreign to Americans as Barack Obama is to common sense, as Rosie O'Donnell is to size six, and Nancy Pelosi is to brains. Did you watch Nancy Pelosi last time on CNN, round table? She has exquisite brains. She blew her opponents away with words and arguments and compassion. That's real power. Well, here's another intelligence term. Before you date my daughter, know I am a dad with a shotgun, a shovel, and a backyard. All rifles matter. Really? Due to a price increase of ammo, don't expect a warning shot. Oh, by the way, a gun owner 
accompany the description of that shirt with a compassionate, sympathetic comment, quote, this shirt is what George Zimmerman should have worn. How sad. How abusive. Can you imagine what Trevor and Martin's family would think of this response? They are laughing. In fact, parents Tracy and Sylvia had just released a book yesterday that came out, Rest in Power, which maybe we all should read. I'm going to get my copy today. I'm sure I can find it at a local gun shop. L-G-B-T. Liberty, Guns, Beer, and Breasts. Funny? And lastly, talk about discrimination. It's okay to pick on African American community or the LGBT community. Maybe we would prefer this one. Guns don't kill people, postal workers do. Do you believe that there are tens of thousands of these shirts sold? Do you think it's funny? Like Amy said? These sentiments are not funny, but horrifically sad at best and incite violence at the next best. I believe these sentiments are part of the mindset of some, not all, but some, hopefully, just a few gun owners. I've talked to them over the years. In, in closing, I reiterate, reiterate my serious opposition, I think, <laughs> to SB 12. It makes it easier to carry, and anyone who opposes me, I'll shoot them. I'll shoot them with a glance with my constitutional right to carry kindness, compassion, forgiveness, grace, and love. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. He didn't say blessed are the P-I-E-C peacemakers. Thanks for listening. Senator Rice Hawkins, followed by Robert Clegg. Good morning. My name is Andrew Rice Hawkins. I'm the Executive Director of Grand State Progress, a multi-issue advocacy organization working on issues of media, state, and local concern. Our members work actively on gun violence prevention and as such have grave reservations about the bills before you today. People carrying hidden loaded weapons, handguns in public create unnecessary risks of intentional or accidental shootings. The presence of concealed guns increases the risk that everyday disagreements will escalate especially in places where disputes frequently occur, including bars, sporting events, and traffic. Historically, most states have <coughs> prohibited or severely limited concealed carrying. Handgun carrying bans were among the earliest gun laws adopted by states, even legendary Old West frontier towns like Dodge City, Kansas, knew better than to allow the carrying of hidden pistols. In the 20th century, some states granted law enforcement the discretion to issue concealed carry licenses to persons who could demonstrate a legitimate need to carry a hidden gun in public, while other states continue to ban concealed carry altogether. Currently, there are 42 states that require a state-issued license in order to carry concealed weapons in public. Nine of these states have main issue laws, which grant the issuing authority wide discretion to deny a license if the authority believes the applicant lacks good character or lacks a good reason for carrying a weapon in public. The other 33 states are shell issue states, which require the issuing authority to grant most license requests. Some of these states provide no discretion to the issuing authority, and others, like New Hampshire, provide a limited amount of discretion to increase public safety. New Hampshire falls into the limited amount of discretion category, which is an important public safeguard. Our law allows anyone to open carry a weapon, but to conceal carry a loaded weapon on your person or carry a loaded weapon in your vehicle, concealed or not, you must have a license issued by local police or officials. New Hampshire does not require applicants to have a specific reason for concealed carry. Self-protection, the protection of others or work-related needs are all considered proper purposes, but our law does require that the applicant is a suitable person to be licensed. For example, if an individual in a community is a known domestic abuser but has yet to be indicted, a strict shell issue state would still give that individual a license to carry a hidden, loaded pistol or revolver. New Hampshire thankfully provides our local police departments with the authority to limit concealed carry for those who are dangerous themselves or others. As you've heard earlier, this common sense law has been in place since 1923 and prevents dangerous people from being able to carry concealed loaded weapons. If this bill were to pass, New Hampshire is opening the door to allow dangerous individuals to legally carry hidden loaded weapons. Right now, uh, if that were to happen, local law enforcement would be forced to allow individuals known to be dangerous and with a track record of violence to carry. 
The gun lobby is pushing to allow anyone to be armed anywhere at any time. For 90 plus years, this common sense law has worked in New Hampshire and there's really no reason to change it now. If anything, we should strengthen our public safety laws. Over the past 30 years, the gun lobby has pushed states to dramatically weaken their laws, regulating the carry of concealed weapons by private citizens. Instead, we should look at strong public safety measures that can be taken to balance the rights of individuals with the safety of communities. In 28 states, including some shell issue concealed carry states, applicants are required to have some form of firearm training or knowledge to obtain a concealed carry license. This can range from certified training courses developed by the NRA to classes in safe storage of firearms and ammunition to a seminar on federal and state laws pertaining to lawful purchase, ownership, transportation, use, and possession of firearms. One state requirement in particular caught my eye. It requires that its firearm training course include techniques for avoiding a criminal attack and how to manage a violent confrontation, including conflict, conflict resolution. Among shell issue states, Illinois, Illinois, Kentucky, Michigan, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Texas require live firing as part of the firearm training component of the law. As more than half of the states in our country already require that a concealed carry applicant demonstrate that they have received training in firearm use and or safety, this is certainly an area that New Hampshire should look into. Almost every state also imposes at least some restrictions on the locations in which concealed weapons may be carried, especially in places where disputes frequently occur. For example, Alaska, Florida, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Montana, Nebraska, New Mexico, and North Carolina, I will give this to you in writing, there are several more. They all restrict concealed carry in bars or other establishments which serve alcohol on their premises. Alaska, as a reminder, has no licensing requirement but does have this law in place. Another chunk of states limit concealed carry at polling locations, a bill which your committee heard last week, and six at public sporting events. The majority of states prohibit concealed weapons on school property, in prisons or jails, courthouses, and other government buildings. Eight states do not require a permit to carry a concealed weapon in most circumstances, but five of those eight states, including Vermont, ban firearms in grade schools, whether worn openly or hidden away. Representative Burt asked last week when I testified before this committee for that Vermont law, so I have included a copy of that in my testimony that I'll distribute to you. And in 1923, when New Hampshire's law was first put into place, the license was valid for one year only, instead of the four years that the current law allows or the five years that the sponsors would like to see this optional license extended to. A lot can happen in a four or five year span, including an individual committing a felony or being charged with domestic abuse. In the majority decision on the 2008 Supreme Court case of District of Columbia versus Heller, Justice Scalia wrote, like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. And he specifically cites, for example, concealed weapons prohibitions have been upheld under the amendment or state analogs. The majority of the 19th century courts that considered the question held that prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under the Second Amendment or state analogs. That is a quote. Contrary to what some may say, this bill does not provide any added protections to anyone, but it does make it legal for those with violent track records to carry a concealed weapon. We shouldn't remove the minimal protection that the New Hampshire Concealed Carry Permit System has provided in the past. In New Hampshire, it is already easier to legally carry a handgun than it is to legally drive a car. These bills would make that worse. It's reasonable to deny concealed carry permits to those who are a danger to themselves or others. What this committee needs to decide is whose side it stands on. In a 2014 New Hampshire Supreme Court case, an individual named Mark Doyum sued this, the town of Hookset for denying his concealed carry license. The individual had a prior criminal threatening conviction and an arrest for domestic violence, among other things. He told a Manchester police officer, excuse my language here, if you fuck with my dog, I'll fucking kill you. The New Hampshire Supreme Court noted that on his domestic violence related simple assault charge, Quote, as part of a negotiated agreement, the town placed the charge on file without a finding and a criminal bail protective order was entered against the petitioner prohibiting him from contacting the complainant. On paper, this individual was not a prohibited person, but in real life, he was not a suitable person to carry a hidden loaded weapon. The court sided with the local police department. As members of the committee, you need to decide whether you stand on the side 
of someone like Doyen, or whether you stand with the Police Chiefs Association and the other local law enforcement who have spoken out against this repeal repeatedly over the years. We urge the committee to vote these bills inexpedient to legislate. If you have any questions about the testimony I provided, my contact information will be available in the written copy I give to you. I'm also happy to take questions now. And there's also more information on the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, which generously provided some of the citations I read today. Are there any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Chair calls Robert Clegg, followed by Representative Wayne Benton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Robert Clegg. I'm not paid to be here. I'm not paid to be here by anybody out of D.C., so I want you to understand I only represent gun owners in the state of New Hampshire. I started telling everybody the story about my father-in-law, who at 92 had fallen down and hit his head pretty bad, and how I pulled into my driveway with my vehicle, and my wife came flying out and said, I have to go to the pharmacy and get some, some medication for my dad. She jumped in my vehicle and headed out quite fast. It was at that point I realized that in the console of my vehicle was a handgun. My wife doesn't have a concealed carry gun. My fear, obviously, is she'd get stopped for, for driving too fast. She'd open the, 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 the concealed carry area, get the registration, and be charged with having a concealed firearm without a permit. So I called her and said, where are you? She said, at the pharmacy. I said, don't move. You have a loaded gun in the car. Now, I wanted her to not move. When I got to the pharmacy, she was holding the gun out the window so that she wouldn't get in trouble. We live on the Massachusetts state line, so you can imagine how many people got more than a little bit upset that somebody was holding a gun outside a car window. The problem I have is my wife's one of the most upstanding citizens you'll ever meet. Ten times better than I am, and I admit it. But she would have been a criminal for no reason. It doesn't make sense. And I'm not looking to take away the ability to get a license. I like to be licensed in a number of states because of what I do for work. So I would need the police department in my community to continue to vet me, and I'm okay with that. But my wife shouldn't have to worry about getting in my car. Now, Part of what I do is I go to tower sites. And I've had more than one occasion where I bet if I didn't have a gun, I wouldn't be standing here. Because people like to go to tower sites in the middle of the night and steal a car. And when that happens, we get an alarm. We have to go up and see what it is. Um, I'm too old to do it now. But when I used to do it, it was nothing to meet five people who were armed. Now, I heard somebody say that there's a poll that says that people blah, blah, blah. One of the companies I was involved in did poll. And I can tell you that when a pollster is hired by someone, they design the questions to get the answer they want. So if you ask the question about concealed carry, and that was the only thing you wanted to, you would start the poll with either positive things, so that the answer would be positive, or with negative things. So you would start, if you wanted 77 people to say, oh no, you would start with a whole lot of questions that were so ludicrous, but say absolutely not. And when they got to this one, they would just continue to fall. And you put it in a certain order so that you make sure, because most people don't even finish a poll. So you really don't know what's happened. So polls mean nothing. And if anybody was asleep in the last election, this is a good example of how polls are wrong. We talk about the Dean Amendment in the Senate. Penny Dean's a good attorney, but as all attorneys, they make their money by twisting words, redefining words, and doing things that are best for their clients. We think that the law is, is good just the way it's written. It's passed before, and nobody's ever had a problem. And I am one of those people that say that since it's been vetted so many times, let's leave it and see what happens. And the idea that somebody shouldn't be prohibited in the state of New Hampshire if they live in Massachusetts and they're prohibited in Massachusetts is something they did, I'm not sure I agree with that. If you're a prohibited person, you should be a prohibited person. If the federal government says you can't have one for these reasons, then you can't have one. And we're not trying to change that. 
What we're trying to change is the idea that if you don't have that piece of paper in your wallet, it's a problem. And while I'm talking about that piece of paper in the wallet, when I was here, we changed the law to a five-year license, and we made it coincide with the expiration of your driver's license, so that you weren't one of those poor people who forgot to renew. You never forget to renew your driver's license because they send you a car. Forgot to renew and got questioned and found out that six months ago, they should have renewed their carry license. That's another problem. Now, I also know, and I haven't heard it today, that people complain about the fees. Depending upon which hearing you're in with the Department of Safety, they either don't have any money or they have a lot of money. Now, if this really, if the fees on carry license really reaches $900,000, then, then that's an awful lot of money, and I don't know how many licenses we actually get. But I would suggest a replacement for it. And that would be a license on free speech. If we're going to license rights, let's go there. Because imagine how quickly the hearings would go if you asked the person, do you have a, a license to speak today? And they said, no, I forgot to purchase one. <laughs> it's the same thing. Either we have the rights or we don't have the rights. And for the, for the poor child who didn't want to run in a road race because of what happened in Boston, I understand that, but that was a pressure cooker. Bad people are going to do bad things no matter what laws we have. We're supposed to have laws that make sense. And it doesn't make sense to tell me that I can have a gun on the side of my body, but as soon as I put my jacket on because I'm cold, I'm now a criminal. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The people who aren't supposed to have a weapon and do, don't really care what the law says. Domestic violence people, they don't care either. If you really cared, you wouldn't hit your spouse. And that's both male and female. I'm involved in one now, now personally, where the woman is beating up the man. It happens. And my last thing I'll say is, y'all know that your constituents, the people that live in the state of New Hampshire, the majority of them have contacted you and said, please pass this. We're not asking you to change anything other than when I'm cold and I want to put on my coat and I have a gun, don't make me a criminal. Please pass Senate Bill 12. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Benton. Senator Benton is opposing the bill. He's evidently not here. And he is the last person so far that is opposing Senate Bill 12. I have the rest of these cards. And in the interest of brevity, when I call your name, you can, you can indicate your support for the bill or you can talk and prolong the hearing. Uh, David Love. Of Derek. Support. Support. Yeah. Mike Topaz. Well, I need to speak just for a minute, briefly. Um, I, I think we've heard. Uh, my name is uh, Mitch Topaz. I am uh, president of Banners New Hampshire, also uh, president of Helm Fish and Game. I'm a high energy red instructor and a uh, NRA fire instructor. What, what it's all been said by, by a lot of people here, but what I want to state again. This doesn't give any criminals any extra benefits. <clears throat> this, all this does is says when you're cold, as Bob said, you can put your coat on. That's it. No criminals are going to be getting any extra benefits. Uh, the people that are going to benefit are folks with domestic violence order. When you get a domestic violence order, it takes 14 days to get your license to carry. Who's going to protect you for those 14 days? Not that piece of paper. So again, I ask you, please pass this bill. All this does is make us not criminals. It doesn't give criminals any extra rights. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Zach, uh, is it a lot of Yes, sir. I will not repeat anything that has been said, but I do have some petitions that I want to deliver to the committee. My name is Zach Lattenschlager. I'm the Vice President of the National Association for Gun Rights. We have 6,000 members in New Hampshire, 4.5 million members nationwide.
nationwide. I do have 1,300 and some petitions here that I would like to deliver to you in support of Senate Bill 12. And we do ask for your support and uh, look forward to uh, New Hampshire becoming the uh, 12th constitutional carrier state. Thank you for your testimony. You can deliver those uh, signatures to the clerk. Ed Cutler. Hi, I'm Ed Cutler. I'm a resident of the state of Vermont, and I'm here representing 4,000 active members of Governors of Vermont and a half a million people of the state of Vermont who have to go through major hassles trying to get a permit in this side of the river. The big problem is most states can get an out-of-state permit here. We can't unless we get cleared by a CLIO because we have nothing to show as far as whether we're legal or not. Um, Twelve years ago, I got a New Hampshire permit. It wasn't a problem. Four years go by, and uh, it expires. I don't realize it. Crossed the river numerous times. I'm only two miles from the border. I shot in New Hampshire. Don't tell the state of Vermont that, though. And uh, not knowing it, I was running across the river without a permit. At the time, we had changed Cleos, and we had a uh, sheriff of Wyndham County who refused to give anybody the letter that we need to have the out-of-state permit, or excuse me, license. Um, this supposed sheriff finally got brought up on federal charges for bribery and a whole bunch of other stuff. We got a new sheriff. Since that time, I've been able to renew my permit without a hassle. But there are many people in Vermont that accidentally cross the river with a firearm in their glove compartment in their pocket, whatever, without that permit, and they're liable by your statutes. We allow you people to come across the river to our side without a permit. Um, it would be really nice if we were reciprocal. But that, I'm not going to take up a lot of time because I know you're in a hurry. I do have some real statistics other than lies, FBI numbers, um, real polls, uh, posing, uh, the insult that certain people in this building have been giving us, saying that we're an extremely dangerous state. Vermont, for 225 years, has been the safest state in the world, in, this, in the country, and one of the safest places in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, as I call your name, you can indicate uh, support or speak and prolong the hearing. Ian Underwood, court. My name is Ian Underwood, I'm from Croydon. Uh, I'd like to address a couple of rationalizations that are often used to justify taking people's rights away, which haven't really been addressed today. Um, many people who would like to suppress the rights of other people are fond of saying, and you've heard this a couple times today, rights are not unlimited. For example, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. I'm always amazed that an argument that dumb has stayed around for this long. I would ask you, for example, you have a right not to be raped. Is there any limit on that? No, there's not. And to conclude that because one right can be limited, all rights can be limited, is a little like concluding that because one animal has fur, they all have fur. It's a non sequitur. It's the kind of thing you're supposed to be able to identify by the time you get out of high school. Also, in case you don't know this, there is no law against yelling fire in a crowded theater. Penn and Teller, the magicians, do this every night in their live show. They've been doing it for years. They're not going to get arrested. They haven't been arrested. And that's because there's really only a problem if several conditions are met, which is one, it's not true. Two, you know it's not true. Three, everybody else doesn't know it's not true. And four, somebody gets harmed. So you can say what you want. And if it causes foreseeable harm, then you can be punished. But that's not a restriction on a right. That's just a recognition that sometimes people commit crimes and torts. So please, I would ask, by all means, let's place that level of limit 
on the right to keep, to keep and bear arms. You can carry any gun anywhere, in any manner, at any time. But if you misuse it, you can be punished, not for the possession, but for the misuse. The second rationalization is, um, people like to quote Article 3 of the New Hampshire Bill of Rights, which says, when men enter into a state of society, they surrender up some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others. And this is used to rationalize passing restrictions on any rights that the legislature feels like. But this ignores a critical point that an essential function of a constitution is to spell out the terms of such a surrender. For example, you can't be searched unless there's probable cause presented by a judge who issues a warrant which specifies what's to be searched for or where you expect to find it. You can assemble in public, but only if you do it peaceably. Soldiers can't be quartered in your home except in time of war as prescribed by law. You can't be subjected to involuntary servitude unless you've been convicted of a crime, and so on and so on. This is what constitutions are for. So if you think some new surrender is necessary, first you need to amend the constitution to spell out what the terms are. And that's a much bigger conversation than just some people sitting in a room. That's the entire state getting involved. And only then can you proceed to pass statutes that are consistent with what you just did. But when Article 3 is misused to rationalize new limitations on rights without first amending the Constitution, the problem is it invites people to ignore not just the new statutes, but all of them. Because if you're going to break some laws, why pay attention to any of them? In for a penny, in for a pound. So every statute that gets passed by this legislature and signed by the governor sends this message to the people of New Hampshire. You should pay as much attention to our statutes as we pay to your constitution. And most of the time, that's not very much attention at all, but this bill offers you an opportunity to eliminate a conflict between constitution and statute, and I urge you to take advantage of it. So it really comes down to this. Even if you think constitutional carry is a bad idea, any alternative to it is a worse idea because it puts every citizen in an untenable position. They have to decide, do I follow the Constitution or do I follow these statutes? And you can't do both. And when you force people to make that choice, you make criminals out of people who take the Constitution seriously. And you undermine not just the law, but the idea of law. And no matter how evil you think, what, you know, no matter what evil you think might be done by a person with a gun, it doesn't begin to compare with the evil that legislatures do when they undermine not just particular rights, but the fabric, the very foundation of law and limited government. Making criminals out of people who are just exercising their natural, fundamental, constitutionally protected rights. Now maybe there are things, that, guns that people shouldn't have. Maybe there are places where people shouldn't take guns. Maybe there are restrictions that would be, would make sense. But as Colonel Sanders liked to point out, there's a right way to do things and there's an easy way to do things. And the right way to do it would be, whenever you want to pass any kind of restrictions on guns, to amend the federal and state constitutions to spell out exactly what those limits of power are in the government and then go pass the statutes. To do it the other way is basically to destroy the, the concept of law that makes civilized um, life possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Barry Ellis. <coughs> if you can not repeat it, I don't know how yeah, you I, do I would like to speak and I'd like to address an issue that maybe hasn't been focused on yet today. Uh, and that's just the issue of fundamental human rights. Every single person gets one life. One life. And if you lose it, it's over. And it's up to each individual to, to protect and defend that one life that they get. And to deny anyone that right to protect their own life or to have the tools necessary to protect their own life is immoral. You know, to say to somebody that you have to jump through these hoops to be in compliance with a law, you could say that this law, the current law, doesn't prevent people from protecting themselves. But to make them jump through hoops to be in compliance to protect their own life is horrible. It's a horrible thing to do. You get one life. 
and the tools necessary to defend it are readily available, and that's good. And to deny anyone that or, or, or to restrict them, I don't know how you can justify that. Thank you. Thank you. We're getting close to noontime, and uh, at noontime I had planned that we would finish this hearing and we would vote on the bill. So keep that in mind. Sid uh, Sprintberry, now you put down four minutes. I hope you can do it no, quicker. No, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to spare you my speech. Uh, my name is Sid Sprintberry. I, I live in Rochester. I am the administrator of New Hampshire Three Percenters, which is about 400 strong in New Hampshire is politically active. Uh, I stand here today to urge you to pass Senate Bill 12 out to the full house. I also would like to introduce a petition here that's signed by 301 of my coworkers that also would like to urge you. This is a handwritten thing I did very quick. I don't have that many friends, and a lot of them signed, so it shows you where people stand are. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Carlson. Keith Carlson, are you here? Keith Carlson supports the bill. He's from Keene, New Hampshire. John Martin. I support the bill two minutes. Are you sure? You put down five minutes here, and I know how you can cut. <laughs> Thank you. My name is John Martin. I'm from Bo, and I speak in favor of this bill. And uh, just really quickly, I'm going to uh, tell you a tale of two licenses. One is my concealed carry permit. I filled out my form. I take it to the chief of police. The chief of police does a mixed background check. They also get to consider anecdotal information like rants that I do at town meeting, uh, complaints I make to the selectmen, signs I have in my front yard. All anecdotal, but they can consider that to decide whether or not I'm stable. But they have to respond within 14 days. I give them my $10. I can carry a concealed permit. Now, last month, I renewed my driver's license. Where do you have to do that? Real ID. My social security number form was over 30 days old, so they rejected it. I had to make another trip. I came back. They took my motor vehicle title that's issued by the state of New Hampshire and had to take it to another bureaucrat to have it approved before they issued me my license. I gave them my $50. They had me stand in front of a blue screen. And I don't know whether or not you can wear a burqa or a hajib on your driver's license in New Hampshire but I had to take my glasses off so I'd be easily identifiable. And after all that, I didn't leave with my driver's license. I got a temporary piece of paper, and I may get my license in 60 days if I'm approved. Now, I don't know if you see the irony and the difference between me driving and me having a gun, but obviously, I'm more of a danger driving than I am carrying a gun. Thank you. I suspect you're correct or not. You know you do well. Michelle Level of Salem, representing the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire. Again, uh, you put down two minutes, but. I'll do it at the last, I promise. For the record, my name is Michelle Laval. I am the chairwoman of the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire. I want to let you know that the problem with the discrimination is active even today. A year and a half ago, I had to renew my pistol revolver license and I was denied by the same police chief who had previously approved it twice. I do not even have a speeding ticket on my record and I was denied by the same police chief who had approved it twice. And it turned out to be because I didn't put phone numbers of my references on the form, and it's not required. It was a complete and truthful application, and I was denied. Turns out through a series of snafus, my hearing 
to get my license issued took 112 days. It was not expedited by the court, as it's supposed to be in statute. It took 112 days. And I'll further follow up. Yes, I got it. I have a copy of my written testimony with the details. I have a copy of the judge's order. It was issued that afternoon, once we finally got to court. But the Women's Defense League also met with the Department of Safety. And we were told by Sergeant McQuaid that he fields calls from police chiefs across this state on a regular basis, asking what is suitable, who is suitable, how do they know. This will provide the necessary guidelines that even the uh, police chiefs want. I ask you to support this bill and please end this discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Simpkin of Nashville. Can you beat two minutes? Less, sir. Good noon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for carving out the time to hear my testimony, which I will abbreviate. I want to sharpen some of the references to data from other witnesses simply because as an economist and a federally licensed firearms dealer, accuracy when it comes to numbers matters. If I write .40 in my dealer book for a weapon that is .45 caliber, I have committed a record keeping violation under GCA 68 and my license to deal as in firearms can be revoked. I want to point out that in 2015, Virginia edged New Hampshire as the third safest state in the union. So we have to do something about the Virginians, and thus I would encourage everyone to go to Virginia and do something nasty, just don't get caught. Uh, but more seriously, we heard from a number of folks that they feel uncomfortable being in the presence of those who are armed. I respectfully suggest that such persons should move to New York City, wherein very, very few will qualify to carry concealed, and most of those, I reasonably believe, are well-connected and wealthy, and that's why they can get a concealed carry license. Whether wealth means that one is a safe handler of weapons, I do not know, and offer no view. Second point where I want to clarify, and thus help the committee, is that the 1855 U.S. Supreme Court decision where the court held that police in the United States have no duty to protect the average person is still good law. Uh, in the words of the 1982 U.S. Appeals Court decision, Quote, it is monstrous if the state fails to protect its residents against such predators, but it does not violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, or we suppose any other provision of the Constitution. On my prepared testimony, copies of which you will receive, you will see an accurate legal citation provided so that if you want to read this decision, or the 1855 U.S. Supreme Court decision, with your own eyes, you can do so. Many people here refer vaguely to a Department of Justice report. I cite to a specific source, and if you Google, and you'll find it, and you'll typically find it on the first page of results. The notion being, I recognize you don't have the time to go to the 15th or 20th page. One final quick point. Many folks who testify today offer the view that, gee, you shouldn't enact Senate Bill 12, and I pray you will enact it, because it's going to make it easier for criminals to carry firearms. At the end of 2014, there were approximately 355 million firearms owned in the United States, excluding those owned by Department of Defense. The source is Department of Justice, Commerce in Firearms in the United States, editions of 2000 and 2015. There is more than one firearm per resident, including infants, who usually don't own anything. The supply of firearms, relative to the number of those who wish to abuse them, is so large that to make a statement that doing away with our carry license is somehow going to help criminals is more than laughable. It bespeaks 
an incapacity to look at very simple data and draw reasonable conclusions. That to me is somewhat scary. In short, this bill, as many have said, eases a burden on the law-abiding, doesn't affect criminals, and I urge you to enact it, to vote it, ought to pass without amendment. Thank you very much. I will be happy, indeed overjoyed, to take your questions. Hopefully there won't be any, but I thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's good to see you again. <coughs> Representative Hall. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Representative Cole, serving the towns of Bowen Dun Dunbar. Um, how many cards are still left, did you say? There's a lot. We have uh, eight cards left. Okay. Um, knowing that time is short, I also believe you guys have a hearing at one, so I will make this short. Um, I am not formally connected in any way with the Live For Your Die Alliance, but last year they did a simple survey of one question, so it wasn't biased. Should New Hampshire citizen allow some should New Hampshire allow residents to carry concealed firearms without a permit? That was all the question was. It wasn't a biased survey. The survey results were 83% in favor, 17% opposed. This is the cover letter for their survey. They had their entire Facebook thread and whatever else to be on SB 116. So I will turn that in for testimony. Um, I would ask that you would support it. I would ask that we expedite this as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Judy Aaron. South Ackworth. You put down three minutes on your side. Hopefully you can do it quicker. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning, whatever. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you so much for hearing me today. Uh, yes, I traveled from South Ackworth all the way across the state. And I'm here today to ask that you please vote SB 12 to ought to pass without any amendments or changes. Obtaining a permit like this one in paper um, requires filling out a form and paying a fee. After that, there's some sort of arbitrary screen on suitability by local law enforcement and some places even alter the forms asking for things that are not required by law. To be honest, when I filed my permit, I met with no one, and the person who gave me permission did not know me at all. How is this any different than having no requirement for a permit other than paying the local government for its permission? Currently, you allow me to have a firearm in the state except if I carry it in my purse or bring it to the range in my car. For that, I need a permit. That seems so silly. New Hampshire's requirement for a carry permit was passed about 100 years ago as so-called progressive as well as prejudiced ideas swept the country. It's a well-known fact that gun owners such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was just denied a permit because he was considered unsuitable. Thankfully, more states are repealing these useless laws as evidence accumulates that do more harm than good. And there are many other states that have what is known as constitution carry laws, and there's no proliferation of crime or increased bloodshed in their streets. In fact, those states with less restrictive firearm laws are much safer for its citizens. I used to live in Connecticut. I moved here about three and a half years ago, and I was appalled at the overreach and knee-jerk reactions to gun crime there. And to be honest, the laws they have been enacted we not have stopped any of the crimes the legislators reacted to. Instead, there are inc increasingly restrictive laws on the Second Amendment only serve to punish gun owners, like me, for crimes that we did not commit. Those legislators were more than happy to give criminals who do not care about the law an edge over law-abiding citizens such as me. I support this Constitution carry legislation for several reasons. First and most importantly, the right to own, carry, and use firearms is a constitutionally protected civil right by both our federal and state constitution. <clears throat> Founders did not require citizens to beg, ask, or otherwise beseech public officials to exercise that right. 
And secondly, as recently as last summer, we know the state police, without any public notice, hearing, or attention, modified the application form for concealed carry license. How is that even legal, as they are usurping your uh, lawmaking authority when they do those kinds of things? As long as a license or permit is required, then our civil right to be exercise our Second Amendment rights will be at the mercy of bureaucrats. These permits and numerous other restrictions and roadblocks prevent women, minorities, and poor people from being able to lawfully defend themselves and ex ex exercise their Second Amendment rights. Those same people are arbitrarily judged by bureaucrats who dole out those permits, and many of whom <coughs> do not know or understand the laws they are supposed to be enforcing. Lastly, as a New Hampshire citizen now, I find it utterly repugnant that pro-gun control zealots are spending millions of dollars and sending out-of-state representatives to come here to tell New Hampshire legislators how to legislate. As a woman who values her Second Amendment rights, and as a citizen of this great state, I'm asking that you remove this arbitrary roadblock called the concealed permit requirement from New Hampshire citizens wishing to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Let us join with other states, as well as our neighboring states, and pass Constitution carry through this committee to allow the full body of the House to debate and decide. Please pass SB 12 today. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, George Lemon of Litchfield. Yes, sir. I'm going to speak the microphone again just for the question of the vote. Thank you. I support the vote. I have one very, very quick comment, which is um, about two weeks ago, I made a mistake. I left my firearm in the car, my daughter, my car, without knowing it, and she was in violation of the law because she doesn't have to still carry the permit. Thank you. <laughs> Anthony Nino, a member. I stand in full support of this uh, Senate Bill 12 for all the informative Thank you. Thank you. Representative uh, Patrucci. Portsmouth. Um, 
Yes, I rise in opposition to this bill. Uh, my wife, my daughter, all of her friends are appalled by the idea of this law, and I am as well. I understand the principles behind why, why some people make constitutional claims here. Uh, let's face it, that was a different era, a different time. I would allow anyone to carry a musket, but you know, you didn't have powder and you didn't have guns back then. So if it's all about carrying muskets, I'd be very fine. Automatic weapons, not so good. Um, it's, I don't have to bring data or statistics, it's common sense that this kind of bill will make it easier for criminals in this state. We're open for criminals anytime we want, and it will make it harder for law enforcement to protect the public. That's not a, that's a no-brainer, okay? Apparently, however, it's true that many people in New Hampshire apparently feel insecure, and they, enough so that they don't think their police and law enforcement officials can protect them. They have to protect themselves. I think that's an incredible statement against our law enforcement community. If 83% of people on this survey say they need a concealed weapon to protect themselves, I'm not sure why we need the police. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joe Hannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'll make this very brief. I know I'm probably batting clean up here. Um, and please don't cut my microphone. I know it's modern times. And the First Amendment didn't really expect that we'd have that trial. So. Um, I wanted to say that I, too, am a survivor. My life and the life of my family have been saved at least two times because of the preventive use of a firearm. So there are 500,000 to 2 million cases a year of defensive uses of a firearm being used to save someone's life. So this is not a myth, and I'm not a legend. I'm just a man who has had this happen to me two times in my life. Uh, we, we, heard, we heard testimony about how this doesn't affect criminals, but nobody actually told you why it doesn't affect criminals. There was a Supreme Court case, uh, some of you may know, Haynes versus the U.S. in 1968, where the Fifth Amendment, was, Fifth Amendment protections were used to say that a criminal does not have to incriminate themselves, so they weren't required to register a firearm. A criminal is not required to get a permit. They can still be arrested for carrying it. They're prohibited individuals but they are not required to incriminate themselves by getting a permit. So the National Firearms Act was amended after that ruling to basically exempt any prohibited people from the National Firearms Act. So they could only be accused of, uh, convicted of crimes that had to do with actual violence or the possession of a firearm, but they could not be self-incriminating. And this is something that would self-incriminate. So this only applies to law-abiding citizens. Uh, we heard the chief of police say that uh, they weren't against concealed carrying, but they were against the use of a firearm, the word firearm, instead of just pistol or revolver. Um, we should let the chief know that it is not illegal to conceal carry a long gun in this state. Good luck carrying one under your suit coat or your jacket. Um, but this law will not change that. And also domestic abusers. This does not, uh, someone who is accused of domestic uh, violence uh, may be considered unsuitable by a local law enforcement but that would not prohibit them from having a firearm in their home, which is where domestic violence usually happens. Um, and finally, suitability, to, to talk to suitability, one last uh, comment. It is a completely arbitrary thing that has nothing to do with the law. We wouldn't want some local official or law enforcement officer determining whether you have the right to vote, whether you have the right um, to speak in public, and uh, we wouldn't want a local law enforcement officer to say who could live in that town or not, who could immigrate to a town. Um, we heard Dr. King mention, and might I remind everybody here that before Dr. King was assassinated, he was denied his right to get a concealed carry permit. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we're going to close a public hearing on Senate Bill 12, and I'm going to hand the gavel over to uh, Vice Chairman Frank Zaparato, and we will do an executive session on this bill. Public hearing is over.
clerk will note that. Further discussion on the bill? Representative Panalakis. Signatures of the blue sheet in favor. Against the ought to pass motion 
I think that we have actually heard on, from during the testimony on some other uh, re bills related to firearms that we have had a concealed carry permit in place, uh, permit process in place for nearly 100 years and it's worked well. Um, some of those same people who testified to that extent, I believe, have, are now um, speaking in support of the repeal. Um, it has worked well. I don't say it has worked flawlessly, but it has worked well, and I intend to vote against the ought to pass motion. Representative Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We could beat this dead horse over and over and over again. We all know on this committee pretty much who's going to be in favor of this bill and who's going to be opposed to this bill. So I, I really don't think that there should be any further delay. I think we should put it to vote, either up or down. Okay, Representative Gagg moves the question. Representative Field moves the question. Second. Further discussion? We're ready to take a roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Motion is on to pass. Motion uh, moved by Representative Byrd, seconded by Representative Field. Again, the motion is on to pass. Remember to depress the button so I can get the vote on the uh, mic. Folks will. The other members will help you uh, uh, with the mic. Chair David uh, Welsh? Yes. Representative Dennis Fields? Yes. Representative Robert Fesch? Yes. Representative Larry Gagney? Yes. Representative John Burke? Yes. Representative Dennis Green? Yes. Representative Carolyn Garbus. Yes. Representative Bonham. Yes. Representative Jeremy McMell. Yes. Representative Dave Testerman. Yes. Representative Scott Walls. Yes. Representative Sharon Shanley. No. Representative Laura Panlakis. No. Representative Roger Ruby. No. I didn't hear you, Roger. Thank you. Representative Robert Randy Cushing. No. Representative Beth Rod. Clerk, yes. Representative Kate Murray. No. Representative uh, Richard O'Leary. No. Representative Lynn. Opterdeck. Oh. As uh, Opterdeck, correct myself. And uh, Vice Chair Frank Saccarato? Yes. Senate Bill 12. Close the year. Executive Session of Senate Bill 12.